Good evening, everyone from Beat the GMAT. This is Sean O'Connor from Stratus Prep Headquarters in New York City. Thank you so much for joining us for this webinar, 10 Must-Haves for your 2013 MBA applications. Just a few logistics before we get started. Um, I have about a 40-minute presentation to go through. Um, and you can go ahead and start typing questions into the question box, which is in your GoToWebinar uh, control panel at any point. Um, but I'm going to hold the questions <clears throat> until the Q&A at the end of the presentation. So you can go ahead and type them in. Um, and then I will go ahead and take them all at the end, because that's usually how we do things here uh, with our friends at Beat the GMAP. All right, great. So let's get started. Uh, and if any matters or issues come in, just go ahead and uh, type in a question. All right. So first, by way of introduction, some of you may know me from uh, prior webinars here on Beat the GMAP. For, for those of you who are new to the community, my name is Sean O'Connor. I'm the founder and president of Stratus Prep. Um, and I attended Harvard, where I did both my JD and my MBA. When I was at HBS, I was in the top 5% of the class, which is the Baker Scholars. Um, I also went to Georgetown for my undergraduate degree. And before starting Stratus Prep, I worked with McKinsey & Company, Lehman Brothers, uh, a Boston-based um, a Boston-based um, law firm named Sullivan and uh, Worcester, and I'm also the author of the Forbes column, The Launching Pad, which is uh, an entrepreneurial uh, and educational column that I write about once a month uh, for Forbes. So I've been running Stratus Prep since 2006, so I've helped literally thousands of folks um, through the MBA application process, and I'm really excited to be with you tonight to share, um, to share with you uh, some of our best tips for those of you getting started early uh, with the application process, which is really a key to application uh, success at the top MBA program. Uh, if you don't know Stratus Prep, you may see us on some of these uh, websites and in the print edition of a number of these papers. So I write weekly for U.S. News about law school admissions, as I also did at JD at Harvard. Uh, and I mentioned my regular Forbes column. I've been profiled a number of times in Fortune and CNN Money in terms of uh, being the expert on how to get folks into Harvard Business School. Um, you can also find uh, some articles that I've written for the Financial Times, including the most recent one was about networking in business school and the most effective ways to do that. Uh, we've also been in Bloomberg Business Week, the Wall Street Journal, and a number of other uh, top publications. So here are my 10 must-haves for your 2013 applications. If you go ahead and read through those, um, we are going to do a deep dive on each one of them. So we start with number one, introspection exercises. So this is going to be structured brainstorming. Now we're going to talk about your unique, authentic story. We're going to talk about how to produce really stellar essays. Uh, we're going to talk about how to uh, command absolutely exceptional recommendations. Uh, we're going to talk about your GMAT score and how to maximize your GMAT score, extracurricular activities and what you need to demonstrate there to be successful in the MBA application process, uh, and then how to have a, a compelling career trajectory in mind, and then a clear idea of how an MBA is going to help you reach your short and long-term goals. This is an essay question at many schools. And then we'll talk about the school specifics of different applications, and finally, how a seasoned MBA admissions counselor can help you through this very daunting six, nine, 12 month process. All right, so let's get going with introspection exercises. So introspection exercises are a means by which we really reflect on our past experiences. And these could be our past experiences in work, our past experiences extracurricularly, but you also want to include in your introspective work your past personal experiences because these can also be really crucial fodder for your MBA application essay. You'll want to start reflecting on your own unique strengths and weaknesses, not only in the workplace, but at home, etc., as well as your future goals. By being introspective, before you start addressing the specific application questions at a given school, you'll be able to uncover and articulate aspects about yourself that you might not have thought previously warranted being included in your application. And this is so, so, so important because as I'm going to point out one or two slides later, you really need to differentiate yourself from other applicants 
who are similar to you, other people who work in the same industry, who work in the same job function, who come from the same geography. You need to differentiate yourself. And the way you do that is by reflecting on your experiences and really thinking and uncovering and articulating what's different about the way you've lived those experiences. Then we will take this introspective information and help use it to create organized and structured essays that will really highlight for the school your key strengths. Introspection is one of the most vital places where an MBA admissions counselor, like my colleagues at Stratus Cup and I, can help you as an applicant. Because in the introspection process, we can give you an unbiased perspective. We can tell you, look, lots of, for example, males in finance write about this. Okay, so for example, many males in New York in finance want to write an essay about how they do volunteer work as a mentor. But since so many people write about that from that particular demographic, it's not compelling, it's not distinctive, it's not unique. So you don't want to spend a lot of time or a lot of space on your application focusing on that because it's not going to get you admitted. Last year we had numerous uh, males from finance from New York City who were admitted to Harvard with GMATs in the mid to high 600s because we didn't let them talk about these things that are ubiquitous that everybody's talking about like mentoring programs or tutoring programs. We had them come up with more unique essay topics. Now when you're talking to different admissions counselors, they should have introspection exercises already prepared for you and you should be able to be coached through their process. If a firm doesn't have introspection exercises that they can speak to at a great level of detail, be really careful because the most professional and expert companies that you really want to invest in with your future will have a robust introspection process. At Stratus Prep, we have about a 20-page uh, series of four or five introspection exercises that is really rigorous and robust and challenges our students to think about what they can do to really stand out from the competition, and that is what leads to unparalleled success in the MBA application process. All right, so we have to be introspective. This is something you can and should start now. There's no reason to do the GMAT before introspecting. There's no reason that you have to wait until the summer to start introspecting. We already have about 50 applicants that we're working with for round one, and they are already hard at work on their introspection. All right, number two must-have for the 2013 application season, your unique, authentic story. So we really need to, as I was pointing out on the previous slide, we need to pop. We need to stand out. We need to differentiate ourselves from other applicants who have a pretty similar story to your own. Your story has to resonate, and it has to come together across multiple different platforms, your essays, your recommendations, your resume, all of that needs to come together to tell a story that is true to you and only to you. It's very authentic and it's very unique. And it's going to make you pop from the applicants most like you. Because when the schools are evaluating applications, they don't look at it just in general. They're looking at, if you're a male in finance, they're looking at you versus other males in finance. If you're a female in marketing, they're looking at and comparing you with other females in marketing. Because at the end of the day, the MBA class is going to be made up of so many people from this industry and so many people from that region. And so you really are competing with those people who are most like you. So you don't want to try to stand out against the entire pool because, of course, it will be easy to do that. The hard work in introspection and in crafting a really unique, authentic story, the real challenge is making yourself stand out from those who are most similar. So I want you to ask some questions. Who are you personally, professionally, and academically? What makes you distinct from other similar applicants? Why should I, as an admissions leader, choose you over others who are similar? What drives you? What drives you? What drives your career ambitions? How are you going to change the world through your MBA experience and beyond? All right. Now we come to item number three on our list. So we've, we've introspected, we've brainstormed, We've come up with a really authentic story that only we can tell that's really going to make us pop. It really has some, some really interesting, compelling details that separate us from others with similar profiles. How do we now weave all that together into stellar essays? So that becomes uh, the next question. So our third must-have, stellar essays. 
first I want you to think about outlining, and then I want you to put off thinking about word limits. I also want you to think about how much editing is too much editing. Okay, a really important question because the schools can tell. All right, with outlining. Spend time outlining your essays before you write because that's going to help you be more organized. It's going to help you be really clear. It's going to make sure that you are sure which story am I telling here, which story am I telling there. If in total all of my essays are trying to tell X story or Y story, how do I put all those pieces together in the most compelling way? Of course, your essay should have an introduction, a body, and a conclusion. Make sure that they follow that. In terms of word limits, so many people obsess about word limits. When you're working with Stratus Prep, the first two or three drafts, we don't even care about the word limits. The word limits come in at a much later stage. Once all of the content is really where it needs to be, then we worry about word limits. So at the beginning, just get your ideas down on paper. And then as you improve your writing and you edit your writing and you make it clear and concise, you're going to be cutting out extraneous words, even naturally through the editing process. And then maybe you'll have one or two edits at the end to get the word limits underneath uh, the required uh, number. Now, how much editing is too much editing? And this applies whether you're going to have your high school English teacher edit for you, which I would not recommend, uh, or a professional MBA admissions counselor, or maybe a colleague at work or a roommate. How much editing is too much? Okay? you got to beware of anybody who's saying, I'm going to do 8, 10, 12, 15 edits of your essay. Why? Even if you thought that that was ethical, that they do 15 edits of your essays, which I would find doubtful, it's not going to work. Okay? Because they then have basically written your uh, they have basically written your essay okay and that's not going to work they can't basically write your essay for you okay um, you want to have very well written very compelling essays in your own voice and in my experience that means going through four to six drafts that's what's optimal okay after six drafts there's none of your language left it's just all editing and the schools can tell that, and they know that it's over-edited. They know that it doesn't sound like a real human being wrote this. It sounds like an automaton, an editing automaton wrote it. And it doesn't hold together. It doesn't sound like a real person, and it doesn't work to get you into the schools that you really need. Okay, so don't over-edit your essays, and don't let anybody else over-edit your essays. Now, on the same token, don't just do one or two rounds of edits either because your essays have to be your very, very, very best work. With the help of editors who, like my colleagues at Stratus Prep and I, we suggest, oh, you could use this word, you could move this idea here, maybe use this phrase instead of that phrase. That's appropriate editing both from an ethical standpoint, but even more importantly, from an effectiveness standpoint in terms of getting in to the school of your choice. All right, next exceptional recommendations. So how are we going to get really, really, really exceptional recommendations? First, we have to choose recommenders who can speak to your strengths and your leadership qualities, and we need to give them enough time, at least at a minimum, four weeks to get the recommendations done. And if you don't know, they cannot just do a generic letter, okay? They can't just do a generic letter. Each school is going to want them to answer specific questions, specific questions. And the questions are going to be different at most of the schools, and they're going to have word limits, okay? So they're going to have to do this through online forms. So it's going to take a good deal of time for your recommenders, so you want to give them that time so that they can be successful. In the U.S., recommendations really have to be exaggerated. So if you're one of our many applicants from India or China or Japan or Korea or Africa or Latin America, okay, we work with applicants from six continents. I'm just looking for an MBA applicant on Antarctica. If anybody knows one, please let me know so we can be on all seven continents. And what I find, especially with our friends in Britain, for example, is that professors and employers in Britain tend to be very understated. If they say something is good, it is really, really good. Well, in the U.S., we are exaggerators. So as you can see from my little tablet here, if they write fair, that means poor. If they write good, that means fair. If they write excellent, that means good. If they write outstanding, that means excellent. So we really need them to go over the top, exceptional, extraordinary, outstanding. And then they've got to back that up. They can't just make those claims. They've got to prove those claims. 
even if your uh, recommender prefers that you not read the recommendation, which is typical, you shouldn't be asking to read the recommendation, your recommender should still be willing to receive and accept feedback from other parties, and that may very well be your MBA admissions counselor. At Stratus Prep, we very often work with recommenders to improve the recommendations because many people are recommending for the very first time. We're not going to tell them what to say, but we're going to say, look, this is how your recommendation would be read right now by an MBA admissions committee. If you want a stronger recommendation on behalf of this applicant, here are some things that you could do to make this recommendation stronger. This is things that the uh, admissions committee would have concerns about. And this ensures that you're putting your best recommendation forward. You've coached them. You've chosen well. You've coached them well. They've taken feedback. And from all of this, we get recommendations that are as strong as the essays that we've worked really hard on together to make sure that your chances of getting in to the school of your choice are absolutely maximized. All right. Next, let's talk about the GMAT score. Now, everybody loves to obsess about the GMAT score, and you have to do well on the GMAT. There's no doubt about it. But remember that your GMAT is one facet in your application. Okay, it's one facet in your application. It's not the only facet, and at no business school in America is it the top, or in, in Europe either, or Asia, is it the top factor in, in your admission. Okay? Essays will always trump the GMAT score. Recommendations will always trump the GMAT score. And I'm going to prove this to you later on with someone that we got into Harvard with a very, very low GMAT score. All right, so let's take a look. What do we need to do uh, to maximize the GMAT? Okay, and the same is going to apply to the GRE. So I think it's better to take the GMAT unless you are extremely good at esoteric English vocabulary. It is much better to take the GMAT. It is true that the math is a little bit tougher on the GMAT, but the GRE, Okay, the verbal is much, much, much more challenging. And so the schools want to see the GMAT. They accept begrudgingly the GRE. They want to see the GMAT. And all of our Stratus Prep students, unless they have already taken the GRE for some other program, everybody we're working with is taking the GMAT. The, the success that has come from taking the GMAT um, is quite remarkable versus the GRE. So first, regardless of which test you're taking, you should do a diagnostic. Um, and there are lots of free diagnostics. You can find one on our website at stratusprep.com. Do a diagnostic, and it'll show you as you're doing the questions and seeing what's going on. You'll be able to see your areas of weakness. And then determine your target score based on the averages, or maybe just slightly above the averages, at your top choice schools. Now, obviously, we have three different choices for how to prepare for the GMAT exam. You can do self-study with the help of some of the resources that are available on Beat the GMAT. You can do a course, either live or online, or you can do tutoring. Now, perhaps a combination will work best for you. I mean, certainly if you do a class or a tutoring, you're still going to have to do self-study. Now, tutoring may be um, most effective. And in my years as, a, um, as an admissions professional, I have found that tutoring works the best. Okay, uh, and so at Stratus Prep, we do offer GMAT prep. Um, that's not the focus of what I'm here to talk about today, but we do do GMAT prep, and we have moved to an exclusively tutoring model because tutoring is just so much more effective uh, than classroom, and we do tutoring on all six continents where we have clients. So you should seek out the best tutor worldwide, not just whomever happens to be located near you. Okay, uh, because regardless of where you're located, there's a good chance that the best tutor for you, uh, someone who has at least five years of tutoring experience, that's what we require at Stratus Prep, somebody who's on the top 1%, also a requirement, uh, on the real exam as administered by GMAC, okay, so that's a 760 plus. That person and someone who has a, a teaching style that works with you, that person may not be where you are located, but that doesn't matter. In the age of technology, you can find the best tutor worldwide, um, and any tutor worth their salt now has, as we do, online tutoring, live tutoring programs that are completely interactive uh, where you're using an online Blackboard. All right, great. So we've gotten through the first five. Just as a recap here, we're going to be introspective. We're going to cast a wide net. We're going to brainstorm about you know, what is important as we move forward in this process strategically. Then we're going to talk about your unique, authentic story, 
okay, and we're going to craft that story together. We're then going to take that unique story, that strategy, and roll it out in really stellar essays. And then we're going to do exceptional recommendations by choosing the right recommenders and coaching them appropriately, and then we're going to really hit the TMAT out of the ballpark, or the GRE if you prefer to take the GRE. Okay, now we come to the second half of the 10 must-haves for 2013 applications. Let's get into extracurricular activities. So your current activities, some of your activities must be post-college, okay? They must be post-college. Okay, so you can't just, I mean, obviously having great leadership activities in college is wonderful, but you cannot just have that. You also have to have uh, some activities post-college. Um, and so you want to show that you've spent some time outside of work, you know, bettering your community, giving back. But just giving back is not enough. So if you spent more days than any other applicant doing uh, work, in your community. That would not necessarily make you the most attractive MBA applicant because the top business schools are looking for more than just the fact that you did extracurricular activities. They want to see that you took on a leadership role, okay? And so when we're working, you know, we're working right now with a lot of our clients helping them put together their profile. So people sign up with us anywhere from one month in advance to 18 months in advance and we don't charge anything different. Uh, and so we have a lot of people about 10 or 15 people who've already signed up who won't even be applying until next fall, 2014 fall, or 2015 entry. And what we're doing with them now is working on how to help them get into leadership roles, get onto junior boards, get into strategic leadership positions, also how to be entrepreneurial in their extracurricular work and to initiate new activities or new programs that have real impact on the community. So you want to demonstrate entrepreneurship and leadership in your extracurricular activities. And it is better to be in a smaller number of activities but take on leadership roles because the MBA admissions counselors uh, at the schools, the readers, the interviewers, they don't care so much that you care about your community. That's obviously a good and important thing. But what they really care about is that you are a strategic leader. And the way that they want to see that strategic leadership is not just through your work um, you know, at your firm, but they also want to see that through your extracurricular activity. They want to see leadership and they want to see entrepreneurship. Get started early, okay? So when college is finished, it's time to get started. But even if you haven't gotten started, I've probably got 25 people right now who we have gotten into some very nice leadership positions who just realized they had this problem last month or the month before and got in touch with us. And we've been working with them over the last, you know, couple of weeks to get them some senior leadership experience, even in activities that they were not involved with until this year. And that will still be very helpful in their application. Okay, you can't join an activity in June or July, but you can join an activity in February or March and still have it have impact when you apply in October or November. Okay, so it is not too late, even if you're applying this fall, to get some really valuable strategic leadership extracurricular experience. All right, now let's talk about that compelling tra career trajectory. Where are you going in the short term? Where are you going in the long term? So first, what do you plan to do after obtaining your MBA? And if there's one thing I hate reading, it's management consulting. Everybody says they're going to do management consulting after obtaining their MBA. That's not going to work, folks. You're not going to get into the best schools in the world by just saying, I want to do management consulting. Okay, it's just not going to work because everybody's saying management consulting. And management consulting, I was a management consultant. It means so many different things to so many different people. Okay, you got to be way more specific and way more interesting than just management consulting. Okay, you know, uh, you also want to don't want to just say I want to be an investment banker. Well, what the heck is that? I mean, do you want to do mergers and acquisitions? Do you want to do industry coverage? Why? How does your past experience fit into this? We have to have way better, way more compelling MBA goals. Okay, then just I want to be a management consultant, I want to be an investment banker, I want to be an entrepreneur. Well, what kind of entrepreneur and where and how and what are you going to focus on? Okay, why are you uniquely suited for the, the career you're looking for? How have your past experiences led you to your goals? So we need to show a continuum, a story from here's what you've done in the past, here's who you are as a person, this is why this is important to you, and then this is what you're trying to, how you're trying to uh, you know, obtain an MBA so that in the short term you can do X and in the long term you can do Y and X and Y are very specific and they're unique to you and they're compelling and they're exciting to the schools. All right, next, 
What's your plan? Develop a plan for how you're going to achieve these goals. You can't just say, you know, I want to be a, uh, a soda pop entrepreneur. Okay, well, how are you going to do that? Are you going to make the soda pop yourself? Or are you going to have somebody else make it for you? What's your unique concept going to be? So consider, after you've considered, you know, the general plan of how you're going to achieve your goals, how can each individual school support you in getting to those goals? Okay? And then be able to clearly and concisely describe your career goals. You've got to be able to give a one-minute answer in an interview to the question, what are your short-term and long-term goals? And the plans for obtaining these goals in your essays and interviews. Because almost every school, not every school, but almost every school is going to ask, okay, for your short and long-term goals as an essay question. Now, if you haven't really decided what you want to do after graduating from an MBA, there's lots of people in your shoes. It's okay. We can help. Introspecting and looking at who you are as a person and what you've done in the past and what your strengths are should help you craft the most successful strategy going forward. It's also really important um, to include this plan uh, into your application. Schools want to know why you need an MBA. And we're going to be talking about this more in the next couple of slides. But they want to know why you really absolutely need an MBA. Well, the reason you need an MBA is because you have a plan to change the world. And that can be a very for-profit for opportunity. When I say change the world, it doesn't need to be. I mean, you know, Apple has changed the world tremendously, and they've made a boatload of money doing it. So how are you going to change the world in a really strong and fundamental way? Okay? What's your plan for getting to your short and long-term goals? And then how is this specific business school going to help you get there? Okay? That is a compelling career trajectory. That is what's going to get you into the top schools. Next, have a clear idea of how a specific MBA is going to help you reach your goals. Uh, so top schools get thousands of qualified applicants each year. Okay, If you don't get into a certain school, it's not because you weren't qualified. You probably weren't qualified, but other people put together a better package. Okay, now there are some exceptions. Sometimes people are a little too old for a certain school, which is unfortunate and, and unfair, but it does happen. Uh, or sometimes, you know, you have a really unique profile and there was someone else who was a Rhodes Scholar and an Olympic medalist who had the same profile. But for the most part, the difference between people who get in and people who don't get in is not people who are qualified versus people who are not qualified. It's a, the difference comes from a bunch of people were qualified, but some people put together this really compelling story and got expert help in the process, and others didn't. So admissions committees want to admit those who demonstrate that they need, not want, need an MBA from their specific school. They don't want to hear that you just need an MBA. They want to hear that you need an MBA from Harvard, from Sanford, from Wharton, from Columbia from London Business School, from NCA. Next, why now? Why do you have to go this year? Why didn't you go last year? Why wouldn't you go next year? Why is it right? Why are you at the right point right now in your career to obtain an MBA? And with the number of applications that schools get being so huge in the thousands for 500 spots or 900 spots, you need to stand out as someone with a solid plan for what you're going to do to leverage this specific MBA from this specific school, okay? Meaning that you have to deeply research clubs, organizations that you would want to join and how you would contribute to and enhance the community. How are you going to use this unparalleled opportunity to change your own life and the life of those around you? All right, so that ties nicely into my next point, which is about that you must create school-specific applications, applications that are tailored to each individual school. Okay, even if the questions are the same on two applications, the answers to those questions should not be the same. And if you're going to get in, will not be the same. Because different schools are looking for different qualities. So schools like MIT and Wharton, they're looking for a lot of analytical and quantitative reasoning. Schools like Kellogg want to see much more of an emphasis on collaborative leadership and softer skills and communication. So you need to be emphasizing the appropriate aspects of your profile to what each school wants. And you can't get this from the website or just from asking them, so what kind of students do you want? You really have to get to, I mean, they expect you to get to know the schools so deeply. I don't know how anybody really gets to know the schools those, that deeply unless it's their full-time job. Okay, which, which it is my full-time job to get to know those schools very, very deeply. 
And so you have to mention the specific activities that you're going to participate in that will enhance the skills that you're bringing to the school that are the specific schools, specific uh, attributes that the school is looking for. And how are you going to impact and enhance their specific, unique, distinct community? So how do you find out what each school is really looking for? You know, you can try to read some information. I, I, the school's website, they're never going to tell you this is what we're looking for. And the schools are going to say, we're looking for diverse people from all different backgrounds. You can try to go on some blogs and see if somebody mentions what the schools are looking for. I really think this is one of the places where an admissions counselor can be your best investment. And, you know, certainly an admissions counselor may not be right for everyone. Um, but, you know, we do spend our lives. You know, I spend 365 days a year focusing on MBA applications, and I've been doing that full-time for almost a decade now. And so you get to know the schools really, really well during that process. Um, and so having seen hundreds of students and what works and what doesn't work, you know, we can really share with you significant experience and expertise um, that, you know, I think is going to help you continue to propel forward uh, the success rates that, at least at Stratus Prep, we are proud to have enjoyed. All right, my final must-have. Um, so if you're thinking about using an MBA admissions counselor, how do you decide? And I don't pretend that Stratus Prep is the right firm for everyone, but how do you make sure that you find the right counselor for you to help you through the MBA admissions process? So, you know, a few things that you should be looking for is any MBA admissions counselor who's worth their salt should take you through a process that includes introspection, school selection, essays, and many rounds of outlines and edits, but not too many edits so that it becomes over-edited, choosing and coaching recommenders, financial aid strategy. If you get waitlisted, they should be coaching on a waitlist strategy. Now, there's a lot of other things that at Stratus Prep we include, but this is the bare minimum, okay? And then how do you choose an admissions counselor? Now, I say this every year, don't choose based on price alone because, you know, a Hyundai, which is a great car, is not a BMW. A Kia is not a Mercedes, okay? So people are priced differently because the quality and the completeness of what they offer is different, okay? And that's why the market has determined different prices for different services. You, number one, need to make sure your firm is experienced, okay? If they don't have at least five years of experience, I just can't see investing your future in them. It's taking a lot of risk. And I think you should ask for success rates. Now, a lot of firms don't like to release success rates. I'm really not sure why. Um, I suspect that some of them might be lower than people would think. I will tell you, we release success rates for every single school, and it's a very simple calculation. In the numerator, it's every person who worked with Stratus Prep who has gotten into that school since we were founded in 2006. So that's the numerator. Every person who worked with Stratus Prep who's been admitted to that school since we were founded in 2006. And the denominator is every student who has completed a school-specific package for that school with Stratus Prep since we were founded in 2006. So it's the people who got in over the people who completed a school package with us for that school, both since our inception in 2006. Okay? Um, so, you know, if, if a firm doesn't want to talk about success rates, I, I would be aware. Uh, an admissions counselor should never do the work for you. They should guide you through the process. Now, they can suggest words and phrases and approaches and strategies. That's all very appropriate. But beware of any firm uh, that sells essays or that writes essays completely for you because I'll, I'll tell you what will happen. And a lot of the firms now, uh, sorry, a lot of the schools now uh, use the software to catch the same application materials being submitted by more than one person, even if it's in different years or different rounds or from different geographies. And so if you use a firm that is using either the same essay for multiple people or has a templated system where everybody follows the same template, you're going to pop up in the system and you're not going to be admitted. You need to work with a firm that invests in the individualized attention that you really need to be successful, okay? That professional and expert guidance. All right, for those of you who don't know about Stratus Prep, I just have one slide here before I get to the Q&A about, about Stratus Prep. As you may know, we have a 60% acceptance rate at Harvard, over an 80% success rate at Wharton. We did have a student with the GMAT in the 500s admitted last year to Harvard Business School, um, and we have had students with GPAs as low as 3.0, um, both national and uh, international students who were offered full or half merit-based scholarships at schools such as 
Wharton, and Columbia. Okay? So not only did they get in with a GPA of 3.0, but they got full or half merit-based scholarships. You can imagine they were pretty happy in the investment that they made here at Stratus Prep because it paid off, you know, 20 times, 20x. Uh, next, we come to what's our secret. Um, so one of the things that makes us really, really different is that at Stratus Prep, you will work with two of us. You will work with a admissions counselor who's only working with five or six clients. This is their full-time gig during the season, five or six clients, okay, uh, during each round. So they have plenty of time to focus on you. And we include unlimited hours of help with them. And then I will personally work within you, with you as an objective evaluator at every step throughout the process. So I'm going to be an objective evaluator giving you feedback at the strategy stage, at the essay outlining stage. I will be the last person to interview you before you go in for your real interviews. So you have two people with unlimited hours of help, okay, that are going to be assisting you throughout this process. Um, and all of our counselors have attended top five business schools. We only hire from Harvard, Stanford, Wharton. Columbia and Chicago, that's it, okay? And uh, many of them are former admissions readers and interviewers. So we think that our experience and our expertise uh, really stands out and uh, quite frankly, the results speak for themselves and we'd love the opportunity to work with you. I should mention that many of our most popular, successful, uh, and experienced expert counselors do sell out for round one in February, March, or April, usually February or March. Nobody is sold out yet, but we do expect that in the next week or two, the top experts will start selling out because each of them can only work with five or six people per round. So definitely um, get in touch right away if you are interested in working with them. Okay, some case studies of, so, you know, I think this page should give you a lot of hope. If you're really nervous, maybe your GMAT's a little lower than you would like, or your GPA is a little lower than you would like, you shouldn't be nervous. There is hope for you, okay? Uh, so Alex uh, was a male in finance. He had a 3.7 from a small liberal arts college and a 6.70. He got into both Harvard and Columbia. He's just graduating from Harvard now. Daniela went to an Ivy League school, had a very high GPA, 3.88, but only a 6.80. Okay, um, she had less than two years of work experience. She worked in sort of social entrepreneurship, corporate social responsibility. Uh, she was admitted to Harvard as well. Um, Victor, 3.0 with a 670. He had been a management consultant and an entrepreneur. He was admitted to both Harvard and Wharton. Uh, Sarah, liberal arts college, 3.7. She only had a GMAT of 600. She had three years of sales and trading experience, and she was also admitted to Harvard. And, you know, if you, I didn't put a, a Stanford example here. If you want a Stanford example, uh, we're happy to go through those. I can tell you, um, for example, we had somebody uh, named James who got into Stanford. He worked in finance and management consulting for two years each. He had gone to a state school. Uh, he had about a 3.6 and a 700 uh, or 710 on the GMAT. I'd have to go back and look exactly. Uh, but, you know, I'm happy to provide uh, examples for other schools of case studies to consider if you'd like. Um, and this is a testimonial about somebody who worked with us. Uh, you know, I'm not going to read it in, in its entirety, but obviously the person had a really positive experience and found that working with us was professional and responsive and that, you know, we're a little bit of a smaller company, so you get a little bit more personalized attention and customization. Resham is, is off to Harvard, um, and uh, she has referred a number of friends and colleagues um, since she got in, uh, and I think that they've all, not every single one of them has gotten into HBS, but they've all had uh, strong experience. So this is the last slide, and then we'll go to the Q&A. Um, so recognize the difficulty of getting in this year. It's going to be another challenging season ahead. Be prepared by budgeting enough time. That's why we don't, you know, we offer you the same white club service if you sign up now. You don't have to wait till May to sign up or June to sign up. We want you to come in early because if you come in early, your chances of getting in go up. 50% of the people, imagine this, 50% of the people that we worked with last year who got into Harvard in round one signed up in either January or February, meaning they were working with us for somewhere between eight and ten months, okay? Um, and so you need to give yourself enough time to make those tweaks uh, to your application, to your profile, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you're going to use an admissions counselor, decide as soon as possible. So we are happy to offer, um, and this expires in just a few days, but we are happy to offer an extra $100 uh, off your purchase in addition to the regular 10% beat the GMAT discount. Um, and so if you mention this webinar when signing up by phone, 
until February 28th at 7 p.m. Eastern. That's when our office is closed. You will get an extra $100 off any uh, GMAT preparation or MBA admissions counseling package uh, in addition to the regular 10% off of our packages. Uh, we do offer free consultations. You can set those up by emailing consult at stratusprep.com or by giving us a call at 212-307-1788. Uh, when setting up the consultation, recognize this is not a free half hour of admissions counseling because I wouldn't be able to do that without having introspected with you and really getting to know you. Instead, this is to discuss, you know, what schools you might be interested in and how we're going to work together to get you into the school of your choice and sort of what our game plan should be about working together. So the free consultation is really about how we would work together. It's not, I'm not going to be able to solve any admissions problems or tell you about if an essay is good or not or any anything like that um, in 30 minutes. It, it takes many, many, many hours. So uh, just be cognizant of what we're able to do uh, in that time. All right, so now I'm going to go to questions. I've been seeing the questions streaming in as I've been talking, so that's exciting. And we do have, you know, about 15 minutes to go over these, so uh, I'm really excited. So the first question, um, what do you do when your job has changed to a less impactful job? I used to be a team lead and my department was eliminated. Now I'm in training. How to explain? Okay. Uh, so I think that that's a really good question. Um, and I think that, you know, you want to be honest without shooting yourself in the foot. So what I think we want to do in situations like that, um, certainly we've got to talk to our boss about this in-training designation. That's just not going to work. So uh, we need to figure out some sort of negotiation with the company. If you've been there for a while, if you were a team lead, in-training is just not acceptable. And so, you know, I would work with you, uh, if you were working with Stratus Prep, to immediately come up with other terms that would be much more helpful and acceptable rather than in-training. Um, and then, you know, we would want to try to talk about what skill sets you developed in the first job that you are now enhancing in the second job. So maybe the first job, you were a team lead, so maybe that's where you honed your leadership experience. But maybe you're now developing some other industry experiences or things like that. Okay. All right. So um, that was a great question. All right. Uh, and one thing to note is that you can get recommenders from, um, you know, all your previous bosses. So your recommender does not need to be, I mean, typically if you've been in a job for at least six months, you should get a current supervisor, although that can be somebody you have a dotted line relationship with. Um, but you can also get former supervisors. All right, uh, second question. I'm going to apply to schools for 2014 admission, but I have taken the GMAT in January 2012. How will my uh, GMAT score be uh, viewed by schools. Of course, I don't have an IR score. That's fine. Most schools, in fact, uh, every major school now, accepts scores that are good from the last five years. So you're not going to have a problem with the fact that you took the GMAT in 2012. Totally acceptable. Not a problem. They're not going to look down on it. Nobody's going to care about the fact that you don't have an IR score. Not to worry. How much does, an, so this is our third question for the night. How much does an alumni recommendation help when applying? Also, does his or her field of study matter? Well, um, if the alumni is not from the business school, it helps zero, zilch, not at all, okay? So if the alumni, you know, went to Harvard Law School and you're applying to Harvard Business School, it doesn't help. Harvard undergrad it doesn't help, okay? If they went to Harvard Business School, it might be able to help, but think about it. There are about 50,000 Harvard alumni, Harvard Business School alumni, okay? At least about 50,000 living Harvard Business School alumni. Um, and so even if, you know, half of them or a quarter, let's say a quarter of them wrote a recommendation each year, a quarter wrote a recommendation each year, that would be 12,500 recommendations. There are only 900 spaces in the class, okay? So an alumni recommendation is not going to carry that much weight unless it's somebody who is uber connected to the school, someone who, you know, is on the board, who gives significant financial contributions, but even that, um, you know, I've heard of stories of people who have come to me after unsuccessful results and asked, you know, they didn't work with us throughout the process, but they asked for us to do a post-mortem analysis, uh, and I once saw someone who had a donor who gave 
um, over a million dollars a year to Harvard and who didn't and this person didn't get in. So um, some schools will not even be moved by that. So a lot of people put way too much. It's really easy to get an alumni recommendation. It seems like everybody in the application process knows somebody who went to all the schools they're applying to. It's not that hard and therefore it's not that valuable. It's going to be much more about your recommendations from people who have supervised you, even if they don't have an MBA, and your essays and your application and your GMAT and your GPA. All right. So that was a good question. Let's see what else we have here. All right. Um, if we can't have our current boss do a recommendation because it will affect our future rep promotions and salary, do we need to explain why uh, in the optional section? Yeah, most schools require that you explain why. Um, and, you know, I want to be really careful that we are um, really, really certain that there's no one who's a current boss that we could use because um, the school's feeling on this is, the fact that it would threaten your promotion or financial compensation is not a good enough excuse. I mean, their feeling is that you should still be willing to use that person because theoretically you're looking to leave your job to come to business school. So why are you so worried about financial compensation? Now I understand, you know, people want to get promoted, they want to get a bonus this year, everything like that, but you got to look at it from the school's perspective. This is sort of odd to them. So that's not a really good um, quote unquote excuse or explanation for why you didn't use that person. So I would think twice, this is something we talk a lot with our recommenders uh, about, and it's something that we talk a lot with our clients about, about, you know, it may not be that bad to choose that person, uh, or it may be worth it even if it is bad uh, in the overall scheme of things. All right, in terms of undergrad GPA, um, I've been hearing that GSB is putting more and more emphasis on this. I have C's in some classes. Would it be worth it to retake those through an educa accredited education class? Um, they're not going to look at the retakes. So it is true that Harvard and Stanford, more than any other school, put uh, those two schools, more than any others, put the highest emphasis on undergraduate GPA. Um, but there's no mulligans, there's no retakes as far as those two schools are concerned. So it's not like if you pull up that you can go retake it and then you'll, they'll, they'll eliminate it. Okay, even if you retake it at your own school, they usually will just look at the original grade. Okay, even if your own school doesn't count it in your GPA, they will usually still look at the original grade. So um, unfortunately, now we've had people get in with low threes into these schools, so it's certainly not impossible, but it is true that they're putting more and more emphasis on GPA. Unfortunately, while a very creative and thoughtful idea, that solution uh, is not going to work. Uh, I will be out of school for five years when I'm applying in the fall of 2013. Should I include all the leadership activities I've done in those five years? Um, no, you need to make some choices. Schools want to see a one-page resume unless they specifically indicate that they, that they would like to see two pages. So we're going to need to make some choices of the most important leadership activities, and that's part of what introspection is all about, is, is making those choices. It's about quality, not quantity. All right, let's see what else we have here. Um, All right. So somebody is asking, you know, if I was applying um, and I have about nine years of work experience, um, what GMAT score do I need to get into HBS? So, uh, first of all, nine years is a heck of a lot of experience. HBS is probably going to be very wary of that. That sounds more like somebody who might be a better fit for like an executive or a part time program. Um, nine years of experience is a lot of experience to be going into an MBA program, and particularly Harvard, um, which is a little bit more on the younger side. They're taking a lot of people with two and three years of work experience rather than, you know, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, so that's, that's going to be an uphill battle for you at HBS. You know, we're up for the challenge if you are, and we'd be happy to work with you. We don't pre-screen people that we work with other than to make sure that you're open to feedback, uh, but that is going to be an uphill battle. Uh, in terms of the GMAT, the good news for you is that Harvard, probably more so than any other school, doesn't care that much about the GMAT. Um, you know, Stanford cares a lot about it. Wharton cares a lot about it, especially the quant. Uh, Columbia cares a lot about it. Harvard, a few years before I went there, didn't even require the GMAT. They just don't think the GMAT or GRE is a particularly effective indicator of business leadership. And so many people with 770, 780, 790s every year get rejected from Harvard. Um, this is something that, you know, baffles international applicants, but Harvard does not make the choice based on the GMAT number. It's just not their top priority. They want to see it, um, but it's not their top priority. So 
you know, we had many, many applicants this year in the 600s who got in in round one to Harvard. All right. Um, so I have uh, a question here from um, a friend in India who is asking, he's been working at an IT, um, an IT uh, major company for the last two and a half years, uh, and he really wants to get into um, a good business school, a top business school. So he's wondering, you know, when should he apply? So if you have two and a half years of experience right now, this is the time to apply. You should be applying now. And the reason um, that you should be applying now is that um, many schools, well, so every school is going to measure um, the, you know, many schools are going to measure the years of experience by when you start business school. And so, um, you know, if you have two and a half years of experience right now, well, you're going to be starting business school in August of 2014. At that point, you will have uh, four years of experience. So that would be the perfect time to apply. Three or four years is the perfect time to apply. I wouldn't wait longer than that because it starts to make it uh, a little bit more difficult to get in. All right. So then a few people had, um, had questions about other schools. Um, and what our acceptance rate is. So one person asked about Columbia. It's over 70% at Columbia. Somebody asked about Stanford. At Stanford, it's over 40%, um, which we are quite proud of, given that it is the hardest school in the world to get into, and the normal acceptance rate is about 8%. A few of other questions, um, you can feel free to just email consult at stratusprep.com. We'll be happy to give you, we're fully transparent here, so we'll be happy to give you whatever information you need on success rates. Um, okay, so somebody's asking, how can I pitch my case um, to a school that isn't very high on the industry I'm working in and wants to work on work in? Um, for example, uh, you know, if I'm in technology and I uh, want to apply to a school um, that is more in the finance or management consulting sphere, how can I position myself for that? So, um, you know, this is a common question. Now, um, what you don't want to do is, is stereotype the schools. Um, and so, you know, schools accept people from all different backgrounds. So um, even a school that's finance heavy is going to take a certain number of, uh, of tech uh, entrepreneurs. And one of the questions was about, or one of the schools the person had mentioned was, was Columbia. If you're from a tech background, Columbia may be very interested in you because they've just started some new programs um, around tech entrepreneurship. Uh, and so it may be, you know, a very, very, very worthwhile school for you to apply to. Uh, and that's something, you know, how you pitch your story. I mean, this is something, if you work with us, we'll probably spend 20, 30 hours coming up with with you. Um, many of the hours on our own, sort of brainstorming, but a number of the hours with you as well. So unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to tell you specifically how to pitch yourself in such a short time, um, but I do think that um, you can be successful even at more traditionally financed schools, even if you don't have a background in finance. All right, so then there was another um, question. Um, about sort of age and professional experience, but we've already sort of talked to how much is the ideal amount of uh, work experience. So I think we've covered that. Um, and then there was another question about getting recommendations from your current employer, which is pretty much required. Um, and then there was someone and, uh, who asked about what are some of the specific advantages um, of Stratus Prep over the other companies um, that are out there. So. Uh, what I can say is, you know, every company has their own approach. Um, we take a very personal family-like approach. We're the only firm where the founder works with everyone. We're also the only firm where you get two full-time consultants working on you, both of whom are graduates of top five programs and who are fully engaged in every part of your application process from strategy to outlining um, to interview prep. So I think those are really, really important. I mean, you can call our office, and if I'm not in a meeting, I'll get right on the phone with you. I mean, that's just the approach that we have. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's a real family approach. We also do a lot of things I didn't even include here. I mean, we help you with the background check once you get into school. We do, uh, um, we actually vet your online presence to alert you to things that the school would be likely to find um, that would, um, you know, actually be detrimental to your admissions. Um, and, you know, I think that the level of expertise and the success that it has resulted in, you know, really makes us uh, stand aside. I'm not going to name the companies, but this individual has, has typed out the name of three competitors here, uh, none of whom, um, you know, are willing to release their success rate. So that is something to, you know, obviously take into 
uh, into account. So I'm just going to try to get through in another minute or two as many of these questions as we can. Uh, someone asked, do we work with people who use the consortium? We absolutely do. We had probably 50 people who were applying through the consortium this year. Um, and so I would be happy to talk with you offline more about um, the consortium and whether it's right for you and what the strategies are. Um, that would be something I would be happy to talk about um, in a consultation. Um, in terms of do we have a preference for which round you should apply in, yes, you should definitely apply at this point in round one. Um, don't let anybody tell you differently. Don't let anybody tell you um, this total wrong myth that it's a more competitive pool in round one and so it's better to wait for round two. That's, um, that is absolutely not true. Um, I can prove that to you statistically. Um, I recently took the GMAT and bombed it. Um, you know, is it worth um, taking the GMAT a second time? This person had a 620. Um, if you're looking to apply to top programs um, in the U.S. and Europe, you should retake. You have plenty of time to retake. Um, but you should not hold up the rest of your application while you retake. Um, you should be doing introspection. You know, we have lots of people who haven't taken the GMAT who have already been working with us for a couple of months. So I wouldn't delay in terms of signing up for admissions help um, just because you still have to take the GMAT again. I would do the two in tandem. Um, then somebody was asking a very common question. Um, I already have uh, an MBA from India. Can I get an MBA in the U.S. as well? Absolutely. We've worked with many students in that position, and the schools are willing to consider you um, for an MBA in the U.S. or Europe, even though you may already have one in a foreign country. Um, this is most common from India. Um, so um, somebody was asking about um, recommenders and you know their level of fluency. I mean. They have to be able to write in English in a way that's understandable, but they're not being graded for grammar. So I would always choose the best recommender, the person who knows you the best and who's going to be most positive, rather than simply the person who has the highest you know, English grammar score or something like that. Um, they, you know, they do have to be able to write in understandable English, but nobody's worrying about, particularly this person was from a Spanish company, you know, that's not something that's a concern. Um, and then someone was asking about if I come from an uncommon background um, in terms of my career, like engineering or government, will I have to prove myself um, versus people from more feeder backgrounds? Well, you, it's not that you have to prove yourself. It's that you have to distinguish yourself from other people who are in government and engineering. And actually, engineering, there are tons of applicants. So it's actually an overrepresented group, um, not an underrepresented group. Uh, Next question, how do top business schools look at those with experience in leadership development programs? Um, you know, this is um, definitely something that um, is highly valued. Um, so, you know, this person was asking about international leadership development programs. I mean, they love leadership development programs because you're being entrusted with a ton of responsibility. Um, so I think if you can do leadership development programs, especially internationally in the developing market, those would be very, very additive um, to your application. Um, okay, and then someone was asking about our experience with um, older applicants. So we have worked with applicants um, as old as almost 50 years old. So um, if you're in your late 20s or 30s or 40s, we definitely can help. Um, you know, you need to show that you're at a similar place in your career as the other people who will be getting their MBAs. And there are certain tricks to doing that. Um, but that is what is really key and something I'd be more than happy to speak to you more about um, if you're interested in working with us in a consultation. Um, so somebody was asking, I have a very low GPA but a very high GMAT. What are the best ways to explain that? Um, you know, you'll want to do an optional essay about that and I would need to understand what the causes of your low GPA are because we're going to need to explore and discuss those. Um, you definitely need to confront that. If you have a 2.8 and a 760. The 760 is not just going to convince them to forget about the 2.8. We definitely need to uh, proactively address that. Um, again, someone's saying like, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to get it from my current supervisor. My advice is going to be, let's really think about that. Are you sure that's what you want to do? Um, you know, unless you've been working for a very short time with the supervisor, um, that's probably not the best way. Um, to go. Uh, somebody was asking about recommendations from clients. You can do that as like a third recommendation, but it is highly discouraged by most schools, um, so I would hesitate to do that. Um, then somebody was asking about your chances of getting in in round three. 
um, or off the wait list. So in round three, they are considering new applicants and the wait list. If you're a very strong candidate, um, you know, we're happy 